Welcome to KnowledgeCast. This is a look into the world of knowledge management, information management, data management, and everything in between. This is brought to you by Enterprise Knowledge. I'm Zach Wall, founder and CEO of EK. Today, we're speaking with Liz Herman, Senior Manager of Knowledge and Content Training at Accenture. Liz, welcome. Thanks for being with us. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Zach. Thanks for the invitation to come and talk about knowledge management, one of my favorite things to do every day. So thanks so much. You got it. And I've heard you speak several times and I follow you online. I'm really looking forward to this. I love your approach to KM. So thanks for being with us again. Liz, if you've listened before, you would know that one of the things that we always like to do to start things off is ask you to define knowledge management. Such a broad term, frankly, really exciting time. The definition seems to be changing every day. So how do you explain knowledge management? How do you talk about it? I'm going to share a definition with you that I used to use when I was focused on really ensuring that organizations understood the business value of knowledge management. So I used to talk about how strategies and processes are designed to identify, capture, structure, value, leverage, and share in organizations intellectual assets to enhance its performance and competitiveness. So again, I talked about performance and competitiveness and how that ties into knowledge management. Because again, so many people, Zach, have asked, like, what's the business value? How do I measure this? What are we getting from this? And so I used to talk about that. And I I do still use that definition. But actually, I've expanded that a little bit. And it actually has to do with you and enterprise knowledge. You and I attended a conference together a few years ago. And I really liked that you talked about knowledge management involving people, process, and technology. So that's kind of that way back definition, people, process, and technology. But I appreciated that you added culture to it. Yeah. So culture, capturing, managing, sharing, and finding information. I talk about that a lot now. You have influenced my definition of knowledge management. Well, thank you. And for the listeners, this is knowledge cast we're wrapping up because that was the perfect soundbite and we're done <laughs> uh, no, actually so as we get into this one of the things that I, I always like to pull apart in one of these definitions Liz is the verbs so you have really good ones here identify structure capture share mm-hmm. all of these are really clear points of value and benefits for an organization using those verbs or others like can you contextualize a little bit like what are you working on now what are you doing in the field of km and how are you offering that business value at Accenture? I am currently working on a federal government contract with Accenture Federal Services and putting together an entire knowledge base for public users of this information, tying that all together, reimagining kind of what this product is for the users and developing knowledge and content that goes around it, but also providing the training to agents who will be taking inquiries from the public who might have questions about this particular product or this particular program. And so there's a whole kind of research and development aspect to it, Zach, where we're researching, we're discovering the information, if you will, which is a big part of knowledge management, right? Discovery. And then we're trying to make that tangible. How does it get out to the public? How does it help our agents help the public? There's a real customer experience component of it. So you've been in the field for a long time, and actually a lot of that, if I'm not mistaken, has been supporting the federal government. Is that correct? Yeah, 100% correct. Pretty much my entire career, I have been a federal government contractor in some sort of kind of knowledge, operations, training, content management, business development role. Awesome. Would you tell our listeners more about that? How did you get into the field and how have you seen the field evolve from the really neat place where you're sitting? Half by accident, half by (laughs) curiosity. (laughs) You and everybody else in the field. Exactly. Well, you know, I started out as a technical communicator. That's the foundation that I always go back to. You know, I I really started out writing software guides, Hmm. but Very early on in my career, I was involved in the relationship and the experience between an organization and its customers. And I moved into training. And again, there was that audience connection. And so I really 
started to think about how organizations manage their knowledge. So this was probably early 2000s. And I really started to see the term more for me and my career. I really was curious about it. And I wanted to get some theoretical understanding of knowledge management. And at the time, it it just so happened that Walden University was offering uh, applied management and decision sciences. Hmm. That program had a KM component to it. And I always kind of had it on my bucket list that maybe I would get my doctorate. And so it just kind of all merged together. And I went into that program. And that's how I started doing more things in KM. Like I started understanding the practical aspect of it, Zach. But then I started understanding theoretical things about it, like related to organizational culture and business strategy and working knowledge, Davenport and Prusak, right? Like understanding the fundamentals that I didn't even know that I needed to kind of embark in this career. Liz, I love the fact that you started as a technical communicator. I mean, that technical background has got to be so valuable, especially now when knowledge management and information technology, for lack of a better term, are colliding in such a big way. How have you seen your background help you to be successful in the knowledge management field? I think I understand the bridge, Zach. Mm. I'm going to use an analogy, the bridge between technology and the people who are using the knowledge. And it's not always easy to cross. You know, there is kind of a divide sometimes between the technology, the KM technology and the people using the knowledge and or creating, capturing, sharing the knowledge. So because I was trying to understand things from a technical perspective to be able to explain it, it got me to this point today where I see the technology and then I just raise my hand and say, but wait, what about the people? How are the people engaged in this? It's the mistake that so many organizations make. And I think you actually, I just read the article that you wrote for Talent Development Magazine and, and you noted it there as well. It's just too easy to buy the fancy new shiny toy and say, hey, we bought the leading software tool. We, we bought the best enterprise search tool. We did KM. And that's, that's such a mistake. It's a mistake that organizations keep making over and over and over again. And, and I, I think you make that point really well. But it does play a role, right? Mm-hmm. Can you speak to, in your existing engagements or in your recent work, how are you seeing technology maybe play a new role or a different role? Or how is it supporting the field and kind of the stickiness of knowledge management? Yeah, I'm definitely not anti-technology. And I think no. sometimes, you know, that Sometimes I think people think KM people are anti-technology and we're not. I think we embrace technology. And what I'm seeing right now, Zach, is I think it's helping us be more efficient and actually faster, right? Mm. So the technology is learning, is helping us learn about, I'll talk about it from customer experience because that's really my wheelhouse and knowledge management is just so, it's just such a close relationship with that. It's helping us learn like the, all the feedback, the analytics, the data all, that we're ingesting from our customers. The technology is helping us get our arms around that and manage it, right? It's mm-hmm. the dashboards, again, analytics to go back to that term, is surfacing things for us that we just can't always surface. Just our human mind alone, right? Us by ourselves in our office can't surface that quickly. And so that's what I love about technology is having that information surfaced faster for us so that we can take action. And that's the crux, right? So surfacing it, big deal. It's just sitting there. Knowledge management, we take action on that pool of data information and act on it. And I think that's really where I see technology helping us move faster, get more awareness, get smarter about what's happening with our audience, with our customer, with our knowledge. Liz, that's so well said. There's a couple of things about it I love. First of all is knowledge management. You don't do KM for the sake of doing KM. You do KM for the sake of empowering action, for the speed of that action, for the quality or consistency or all of the above of that action. And technology is an enabling factor to that. It can help and it can it can remove some barriers that previously exist in the field. So really well said. Now, in your definition, you, you talked about business value. And I really, really am so happy to always talk about this because I think that for a long time it was lacking from the field. Can you speak in your experience to how you 
this is a tough one. How you prove business value and knowledge management. What are some of the, the ways that you look to, to demonstrate the value of knowledge management to one of the agencies for whom you work? I feel like I have been very fortunate in an operations environment, Zach, where there are very clear metrics service level agreements and key performance indicators. Like I just have been fortunate to work in that industry. So there are already some guidelines and boundaries and goals that we are trying to achieve. So I can hang knowledge management on that pretty easily. And how I do that in operations, like think of contact centers or people making phone calls or chatting with the federal government. I can show, I can demonstrate that by having an improved knowledge base and having customers, giving the customers the ability to self-serve or find their own answer, that it is reducing the burden on tier one support, so to speak. And I can show that quantitatively, right? So I can say, hey, calls are down. We're seeing maybe knowledge articles are up and there's this comparison that we can make a direct correlation between these two. So I feel like it's a little bit easier for me, if that makes sense, because in this specific industry, there's already all of these metrics that I can see and that are industry standard and we can hook to. I still have to know the data and it has to be fact. I can't just make it up. I mean, I wish, but <laughs> I really I really try to like make sure that I am showing value by those metrics and comparing knowledge with what's happening in the service industry. I think that's great. And you're right. I mean, as far as call centers go, it's it's one of the places where KM has been around for a long time and I think is most measurable. And so you hit on one really important thing I want to restate for our listeners, and please tell me if I get this wrong. The basic idea is, is self-service. If more folks in need of information, help, guidance can self-serve, can get it themselves, then I think the official term is call deflection. They don't need to call the line. They don't need to be put on hold. They don't need to get bounced around. They don't need to wait for somebody to answer the phone. They have self-served. They've gotten the answer. They're happy and done. And okay. so it's they're happier, but it's also uh, less drag on resources. It's less call agents that need to be standing by waiting for the phone to ring. Did I get all that right? 100%. Absolutely. Cool. And then to me, the corollary to that is the idea of tier one resolution, because there will always be people that want to speak to a human, and we don't want to stand yep. in the way of that. Mm -hmm. But if when somebody does call, the phone can be answered quickly, the person can get the right answer, the consistent answer, and basically go about their business without having to get bumped up to a tier two or getting put on hold, that again, improves productivity and improves happiness of the caller and just overall saves resources. Are you measuring that side of things as well? Yes. And even when you think about tier two, to your point about people will always call or people will always need assistance. You can solve the easy things, right, through self-service, but sometimes you have to talk to someone to get resolution for your issue. For tier two, it's really allowing those people to be specialists and really kind of work to solve those complex problems that they're generally passionate about solving for the customer. So I think it benefits the employees as well because it's just better engagement. So I always am focused on customer experience, Zach, but I like the customer experience to be our employees as well. I like the employees to be engaged and happy and comfortable with knowledge management. And so I, I think there's maybe a less measurable aspect of that in employee satisfaction that good knowledge management can contribute I, to. I actually think it's pretty measurable. If you're looking at this holistically, what you're going to see is improved employee satisfaction. And even if you play it out, improved employee retention. And in the midst of the great resignation, if we're saying, hey, we're going to do a great job of onboarding new employees, we're going to upskill them, train them, develop them, show them a path forward, and we're going to give them all the resources to be effective in their job, they're going to stay. And you can show that. I mean, I, I actually think there's huge ROI there. And, and so you're hitting it from both angles. Going back to the metrics, we're going to get into the weeds with this question, but I think our listeners would really love to hear this, given your expertise. You mentioned the idea that there's some maybe simpler material that fits really well for self-service. 
And then there's other more complex things where the call needs to happen and the call even needs to go up to a tier two. What's your approach to dissecting that? How do you begin assessing a call center, for instance, and saying, this is the material that is ripe for self-service. This is the stuff that we maybe want to push down the roadmap to the future because it's really complex, rather than that which we really want to get out there quickly. How do you figure that out? You start at looking at what the call topics are. So from a KM perspective, I mean, we talk about, we haven't talked about it here, but you and I have talked about this previously, and I see the excellent work that enterprise knowledge is doing in the realm of like taxonomy and ontology. So it's like, what are those topics? I'll use a very, very basic password reset. Okay, do you have to talk to me to do a password reset? Or is there a way that you can do it online with all the authentication and identification methods that are now available? Do you really need to talk to someone about a password reset? So it's really looking at what's the volume? What are we seeing? And then breaking it down, like, again, looking at the analytics to say, okay, we're getting a thousand calls about password resets every day. Is that really necessary? Is there a way to take those calls and move them somewhere else? Conversely, we're getting a call about someone who is having an account issue, really needs some kind of account support. Those are things that are less like self-service and maybe a person actually needs to touch something to fix that account. So it's really like, what is the resolution? Can we resolve it on the first call? Well, if you can resolve it on the first call, then maybe we can automate it. Maybe we can do something better with that. If it can't be resolved, it's an account issue that has to go up to the next level. How do we make that transfer process efficient? What are those topics? And it really is like if you had a big whiteboard in your office, literally just breaking it down by topic and then investigating from a knowledge management perspective and a technology perspective, okay, where does this meet in the middle? What can we move off, shift left, we call it? What can we yeah. shift left to customer to uh, self-service versus, okay, this person needs to talk to someone to resolve this yeah, issue. That's really helpful. I'm actually kind of picturing a matrix, right? So on the one axis, you've got the complexity of the topic. And then on the other axis, you've got the volume of calls. And what you're doing is basically plotting and you're saying, we're getting the most calls on this very simple topic, this would be a huge needle mover if we're able to move it to self-service. That's really practical. It's It yeah. sounds simple. I know it's a lot more complex because in order to do that, you need to understand the business and understand what can be moved to self-service, as well as understand the analytics underlying everything, which is often not as readily available as one would hope. I would imagine sometimes you go in to a new project and the agents kind of have a sense of it. They can talk about it, but the data is not as readily available as you would like. Does that ring a bell for you? It does, because I think collecting anecdotal data is important, not just the analytics and the numbers, Zach, but what's the anecdotal information from the agents? What are they hearing? What are they saying? You know, the things that you get from your employees just anecdotally is such a big part of that. So I really trust in that as much as I trust in the numbers, right? And figuring out, well, what are we really hearing? And is this really fixing the issue? So you can do a lot of things, right? Pull a lever, you know, hit a button, move a dial and switch things around and move from self-service back to in-person service. But what are we getting out of that? Is it really working? So that's kind of the other part of the story, right? Is once you've made that change or moved in that direction, how do the employees feel about it? Is it working? And then how is it working for the customers? Yeah. Continuous feedback. I, I think that's great. And it's something that I've consistently heard from you when I've read your work and when I've heard you speak. And I think it inspires just a huge amount of confidence. You've always focused on this idea of really listening, you know, listen more than you talk and make sure that you are listening for what people are struggling with and what they really wish for. And I think that's such a critical component of an effective knowledge management transformation overall is to really make sure that you understand the people that you're trying to help before you start diagnosing fixes. So well done. I really appreciate that about what you do, Les. Let's go a little bit broader. What excites you about the field right now? What's got you fired up? What are you excited about? What's coming next? Well, I think, Zach, people are probably going to expect us in KM to say like AI or (laughs) it just their chatbots. It just seems like I cannot. (laughs) 
I cannot uncouple AI and chatbots from KM. So I'm going to answer it a little bit differently. I mean, we've established kind of earlier in this discussion that I have been working with the federal government for most of my career. So for me, I'm most excited about the initiatives coming out of the federal government related to customer experience where I feel knowledge management has a real home. Mm. I've been in a place of privilege with this career with the federal government to see the RFPs request for proposals or RFIs request for information come out with KM as a legitimate piece of the business as a part of like helping beneficiaries or veterans, farmers, ranchers, whomever it may be. It's just very validating Mm -hmm. for me. So the president's management agenda, you know, there's a priority too around federal services and customer experience. For me, I feel like I've waited a long time to see that be realized. And it's exciting. It's it's so exciting. And I think we can do better. The federal government as a whole can do better for our constituents when it comes to helping them solve problems that they may have. So that's what I'm excited about. Yeah, I love that point. And I also love your enthusiasm for supporting the public mission because Lord knows we need strong, smart people uh, doing exactly that. I, I think a lot about this. I mean, one of the critical roles of government is to be purveyors of knowledge, of information in all its forms, to collect it, to analyze it, to spread it around, to get it to who needs it. And frankly, it's been mm-hmm. a frustration of mine that knowledge management hasn't been more embraced at the federal level. But it sounds like you're seeing some progress. Can you tell me more about that? Because I, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I think just a the recognition that there's something out there called knowledge management that can make things better for your constituents is kind of the first thing. But actually having leadership support within the agency Mm -hmm. to support those initiatives and really kind of tackle it from the organizational culture perspective that we're going to come together and do this initiative is something that I'm seeing now. So it's not just one department doing the initiative. It's like the CIO is involved and talent development is involved in human resources and contracting and all of these people now are involved, that's a big Mm. change. There's much more commitment around the issues, which is big. I know there's been some significant work done in knowledge management with the General Services Administration and their kind of digital transformation and their transformation technology that really is pushing KM to the forefront. And again, just super exciting to see. And I've been able to work on a few of those projects. And it's really been like a collective effort of the agency. Fantastic. Why now? Why do you think you're seeing this progress? It's, I, I'm sure, in no small part due to the work of you and others that have been living it every day and sharing the messages and trying to educate the right people about the value of KM. Is that what you think is driving the transformation? Is it the pandemic and remote work? Is it the great resignation? Is it all the above? Like, Why is this that moment? I think it started before the pandemic. I think it started in 2012, 14, 15. I missed 2013 there. I know how to count. Nothing nothing happened in 2015. Don't worry about that. A a decade ago, about a decade ago, I think because service got bad and it got a lot of publicity. I mean, we were not helping our veterans, right? We were not helping our healthcare beneficiaries in the way that we could. So in my opinion, that's what started to force change is because people said enough. I am a beneficiary. I am a veteran and you are not helping me get the services that I need. And that is a service that you are supposed to provide for me. And I think it made a lot of people pause and think, wait a minute, how how do we do this better? How do we as an organization manage what we know, right, to your point earlier, and make it accessible to the public? That's our mission. That's our duty. And how do we make it better? And I think that started this whole cascade of we've got to figure this out and we've got to do right by people. And that has really kind of turned into this tsunami about caring for the customer and making sure that they have what they need. Excellent. So you're really linking knowledge management and customer service, which from where you're sitting makes a ton of sense from the business value and ROI is very measurable. 
What are you seeing as far as the more kind of internally facing side of knowledge management within the federal space? Have you touched that world at all? More about knowledge retention, knowledge transfer, findability, reusability, discoverability of knowledge for an employee to be able to do their job? Two things that come to mind right away, Zach. One is fear. So what I have seen with knowledge management, you've probably experienced that yourself, is when you go into an organization and you start talking about collecting knowledge and capturing knowledge and taking what people know in their heads, the tacit knowledge, and making it explicit, there's real fear around that. Because these people, I mean, they may have 20, 30 years at this agency and and they know it in their head. They know it. And it's scary for people. And it brings up a lot of fear when you come in and say, hey, we want to take what you know and like make it public and put it out there so everyone has it. It's so tied with their identity, right? So there's a lot of pushback around that and fear and change management processes that you need to go through. From my perspective, I always approach it from like, I value your knowledge. You are valuable to this knowledge management process. And I'm not trying to replace that. I'm trying to kind of augment, supplement what you know to make it accessible to other people. So working through that is definitely what I've seen from an agency perspective, working through that fear. One way that I have countered it is getting them engaged in the process. That's where sometimes I think KM efforts fail because you just don't engage the Mm -hmm. people. So very specifically, I'll just share a short example in a knowledge-based process flow, letting them be part of that process, letting them be part of the flow as a terrific subject matter expert and letting them look at the information and be like, yeah, that looks right. Or no, I think we can do better. Just simply engaging them and giving them a voice in that process so that they're actually, they see themselves in the actual workflow as a SME, as a mentor, as someone who contribute knowledge is one way that I've addressed it and really tried to show them, demonstrate to them that I do value your knowledge. I'm not trying to take it away or do something with it. You are still a SME and you still have all this great knowledge. What a clean and simple approach. Take away the fear of being made obsolete and instead put them at the center of a process where they're raised up as a subject matter expert. And if anything, it delivers more visibility and more job security for them. Again, it's one of those things that sounds so simple. It's very difficult in practice, but I think that it's such Mm -hmm. a wonderful approach when you can actually pull it off like that. When I encounter those people that are worried about giving up their knowledge, I always ask them the question of, what's the question you always get that you're really sick of answering? We want to take that away. We want to free up your time to work on the really important, really critical, new, innovative stuff instead of that repetitive, old, oh my God, I wish I didn't have to talk about this ever again thing. Yes, that's it. That is it exactly. That's so smart because they all usually can have a very quick answer to that. Yeah. The second thing I'll say internally is that there's just initiative fatigue. Mm. I saw that I didn't really realize it until I came in as part of like one of the initiatives. And I realized they go through a lot of initiatives, not related to KM, just everything. There's like a new agenda, a new initiative. They're doing something new and it causes fatigue in the organization. And I think there's even like issues with trust around it, Zach, because they're like, okay, so you're going to come in, you're going to be here for a year, then you're going to leave. And so that's something I see really a real thing that I see in working with organizations is that they're a little fatigued and they have some trust issues about where this initiative is going to go. Uh, This one is a lot more nefarious to me. And I would even go specific to knowledge management about it. I think a lot of agencies have been burnt by KM initiatives that held a lot of promise Mm -hmm. and failed to Mm -hmm. deliver. So what do you do about this? You are in an interesting situation because you're coming in as the consultant, the external subject matter expert with very impressive credentials and letters before your name. And I think a couple letters after your name too, and all this important (laughs) stuff. And uh, people want to trust you. They want to believe you, but there's the potential that they've also heard the same thing from somebody else. How do you convince somebody that you're going to do it differently, that you're going to really help them? 
I think I would start, Zach, by saying this is not a one and done. So if we're not talking about a long-term plan to manage knowledge and engage employees and use technology to enable all that, then I want to be very transparent up front that these are the reasons why things fail and that you're at risk. There's just so many things that still happen in knowledge management that like it's a year in engagement and then the funding goes away and all the people go away. But knowledge is, and I know you know this, I'm preaching this to you, but you know it by heart. Knowledge is living and growing and moving and changing. And you can't just spend a year doing things with it and then walk away from it and expect to get the same results. So I really try to educate, I guess, try to educate people that there has to be funding for this after I go away. People have to be educated on this to maintain this when I go away, when the gig's over, it has to be sustained. And I think too many organizations are still missing yeah. that. I don't know. Interested in your perspective on it? Oh, for sure. I think, first of all, you said a year. I think a lot of folks are expecting meaningful progress in three months and then we're done mm. and everything's going to be fine and good. And so I totally agree, Liz, that I think setting the expectation that it's a road, it's a journey, it's a potentially a multi-year path is one piece of it. I think that the counterbalance to that is to try to find little wins, to try to find meaningful, mm -hmm. little tangible wins that the average end user will feel in a matter of months instead of years. So you can to use your previous analogy, bridge the gap between show me something mm -hmm. now, don't make me wait years, and set the expectation that to really do it right, a true transformation of the organization is going to take a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of patience and a lot of focus. So I 100% agree. Mm -hmm. It kind of goes back to the technology conversation too, right? There's too many pretty slick sales folks that are saying, hey, just buy this thing and stick it in and you're good to go. So that's, right. uh, yes, magic. magic. Uh, so you talked a little bit about your background before, and you've taken a, like many in the field, a circuitous path, but in some ways, especially with your education, a little more direct than others. How would you guide somebody who wants to be you in 10 or 20 years? What would you recommend somebody just starting out in their career do if they want to end up where you are? I think find your network and find organizations that do this work and stay close mm -hmm. to them. So whether that's you and Enterprise Knowledge, whether it's the Knowledge Management Institute, whether it's Pioneer Knowledge Services, I mean, find your network and stay close to them. I would not have the ideas that I have about knowledge management if I wasn't staying close to people like you and people who are talking it and doing the work and creating new things for knowledge management. And so that takes a little work, but if you put in the work, I think it pays off. So you can find a lot of stuff on LinkedIn. I think it's easy to stay connected these days. I think it helps if you have a natural curiosity, you know, you want to help people, some communication savvy. And then, gosh, I think, Zach, I would still tell those people you have to look in the nooks and crannies for positions related to knowledge management. I mean, your website, Enterprise Knowledge website, I mean, yes, <laughs> knowledge management careers. Ooh, I see them. Yeah. But yeah. in so many <laughs> in so many other organizations, it's not mm. called anything that you would even think of as knowledge management. So look in the nooks and crannies for people who are doing the work related to knowledge management. I mean, they could be called content strategists. They might be called technical communicators. They might be called a business analyst, business operations processor. Yeah. I mean, it's just takes some work to kind of find those positions that have that link to knowledge management. It may not be over. That, that's a great recommendation. It actually opens up the opportunity for me to ask you about your current title at Accenture, Knowledge Content Training. So I know you as a knowledge management professional, really known name in the field. I'm not sure that if I didn't know you, I would have said, we got to get Liz on the podcast, knowledge content training. So what does that title mean at Accenture? Is that like a standard title or how do you fit into that? I mean, the words are all right. It's just a little different than I would have expected. <laughs> It's so literal. It's just the name. It's the name of the work that is done on the okay. team. 
So there's knowledge work that's done on the team. There's content management work that's done on the team. And then we deliver oh, training. So it's literally. There should be comma. What does this team do? Knowledge, content, training. That, that's You need commas yes. and an exclamation point at the end. And then it 100% makes exactly. sense. Okay, I got it. Yes. All and Now, for me, from my perspective, all under the umbrella of knowledge management. But yes, it's the literal work that is done by people I on my it. team. Now, can you speak to, within Accenture, how knowledge management as a service is represented? Are all the knowledge managers together? Is there a community of practice? There's commercial work and there's federal work? Like... Accenture is such a vast organization with so much expertise within it. How do you find other KMers within the organization and how are you orged together or separately, if you can speak to that? Yeah, I really rely on people who have been at Accenture longer than I have. I haven't been there that long. Um, And so I'm using my network there to find other people who are connected to KM initiatives, because you're right, it is a very large organization. I just had a conversation, a coffee chat, virtual coffee chat with someone today in the organization who is doing knowledge management. So I was like, we found each other. I was so excited. And we talked about, we need to do some legwork to reach out into the organization to find other people. We think that there's a community of practice, but we need to kind of like look into that. But because it's our passion, I mean, we're kind of willing to spearhead yeah. that and see what we can get. I think like most organizations of that size, there are elements of it happening all over. And if I can kind of put a string around it and tie it together and pull people in a little bit closer, that's what I'd prefer yeah. to do. So we can actually talk about knowledge management as a cohesive practice. Excellent. And we'll close with this, Liz, with all your experience and all your successes, if you had to boil it down to just that one must statement in order for an organization to be successful with knowledge management, they must establish a long-term plan that has people as a bigger part of it than the technology. I like every word that you just said. That was very well done. <laughs> good, good, good work. Good job. Excellent. Well, Liz Herman, Senior Manager of Knowledge, comma, Content, comma, and Training, exclamation point, at Accenture. Such a pleasure to get to speak with you again. Such great insights. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. For those out there, thank you for listening to this episode of Knowledge Cast. And to check out more on knowledge management, visit our website at enterprise-knowledge.com. Thanks, everybody.